After 15 years of banishment from his native Persia, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, was exiled in 1868 to this land under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. He was imprisoned in this fortress city, which he referred to as the most great prison. For a period of seven years, he was confined to the house of Abud, where the most holy book of the Baha'i revelation was revealed. At the appointed time, through the initiative of his eldest son, Abdul Baha, the Blessed Beauty proceeded out of his residence in the house of Abud down these stairs, towards the door that opened to the back streets of Akko. In kingly manner, he entered the waiting carriage, which took him through the narrow streets of Akko. and out of the city via the land gate to the countryside. Having been deprived for so many years of closeness to nature and the beauty and verdure of the countryside, it was Abdul Baha who arranged this location in Masrai for Baha Law. During his sojourn here, Baha Law visited a beautiful spot in close proximity to Akko which he called the Garden of Rezvan. In 1879, Baha'u'llah moved from Mazrae to the mansion of Baji, where he lived for the remaining 13 years of his life, passing away in 1892. It was in this delightful place that the grandeur and majesty of Baha'u'llah were manifested to friend and foe alike. Well over a century later, the mansion and its surroundings may be seen in their full glory. It was during this period that Baha'u'llah revealed tablets to certain individuals, bestowing on them the title, Hands of the Cause of God. Baha'u'llah referred to these special few as the chosen ones, the detached souls, and the pure in spirit. In the Tablet of the World, Lo Hedun Yo, revealed shortly before his ascension, the Blessed Beauty described the loftiness of the station of the hands of the cause of God.
This film is about these God-intoxicated heroes and heroines of the Baha'i faith, each of whom was elevated to the rank of Hand of the Cause, either during their lifetimes or on their passing, by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, or by Shoghi Effendi. Committed to the principles and teachings of Baha'u'llah, these valiant souls expended all their energies towards the advancement and protection of his cause, while maintaining a life free from fanaticism and dogma. They associated with people in friendship and harmony and pursued their careers. Yet their entire lives were energized by the single purpose of serving their Lord and diffusing his divine fragrances to everyone they encountered. This film is also about the hands as a body, an institution with accomplishments unprecedented in the annals of religious history. The first four individuals to be honored with this distinction were Jenaba Haji Mullah Ali Akbar Shahmizadi, known as Haji Ahund, Jenaba Mirza Muhammad Taqi, known as Ibn Abhar, Jenaba Mirza Ali Muhammad, known as Ibn Astaq, and Jenaba Haji Mirza Hassan, surnamed Adib. According to the Blessed Beauty, there were others who were accounted as hands of the cause in the sight of God, but whose names in his wisdom he did not publicly reveal. Among these were Agha Mirza Agha Afnan, entitled Nur din who was the nephew of the wife of the Bab and to whom was addressed the Tablet of the World. He and his family were nominated as the hereditary custodians of the House of the Bab in Shiraz. Jenab Shah Mirzadi, or Haji Ahund, attained the presence of Baha'u'llah in 1873. During his life, he was imprisoned six times and spent altogether about seven years bound in chains and fetters in many gloomy dungeons. On one occasion, only three days after his marriage, he was jailed for seven months. On another, he was imprisoned for a long time with the trustee of Hurur, Haji Amin. Abdul Baha saw this picture and noted that they were both sitting composed, acquiescent, undisturbed while in chains and shackles. Haji Ahun was praised by Abdul Baha in his book Memorials of the Faithful for his steadfastness and unshakable faith. I loved him very much for he was delightful to converse with and as a companion second to none, said Abdul Baha in his eulogy. A great achievement of Haji Ahun's was the transportation of the holy remains of the Bab to Tehran and their protection in various places such as this mosque until further instructions were given by Baha'u'llah. Janabi ibn Abhar was in his youth overcome with thoughts of martyrdom. So strong was his yearning that he sought Baha'u'llah's preference between laying down one's life for the love of God or that of teaching the cause with wisdom and the power of utterance. The Blessed Beauty advised him of his preference for the latter, that after the heart-wrenching martyrdom of the youthful Badi, the friend should act with prudence and care. Martyrdom is the greatest bounty, provided it takes place through circumstances beyond one's control. In 1886 at Bahji, Ibn Abhar attained the presence of Baha'u'llah who directed him to pass through the cities of Persia and spread the divine fragrances of his message. This he did until his imprisonment again in 1891 in the Siachal, the notorious dungeon in Tehran. Here, Ibn Abhar is shown in chains with guards surrounding him. The inscription is a tablet from Abdu'l-Bahá in his honor. 
Even in prison, he managed to teach the faith and was to suffer severe punishment, including the bastinado, which involved flogging the soles of the feet until they became bloody and immobile. To console his loved ones, he wrote a letter which said in part, I swear by God the exalted that while my legs from knee to toe were in great pain, my soul was communing with my beloved in the utmost joy. For pain and bodily swellings will die down in a few days' time. Only their mention will remain in this world, but their bounty will last in the world of spirit till eternity. Janabe ibn Astaq, at a young age, accompanied his father to Baghdad, where they both attained the presence of Baha'u'llah. This face-to-face -face meeting with the supreme manifestation of God left an enduring impression on him and galvanized his entire being. On his return to Tehran, he was thrown with his father into the dungeon of that city and underwent the agony of torture and imprisonment. In a submission to Baha'u'llah, he pleaded for martyrdom. In response, Baha'u'llah pointed out that martyrdom is not confined to the shedding of blood, as it is possible to live and yet be counted a martyr in the sight of God. Two years later, Ibn Astar again asked for martyrdom. Abdul Baha then addressed him as Shahid Ibn Shahid, or Martyr, son of Martyr. Thus, both father and son were granted this lofty station while still alive. Adibul Ulama, which means man of the learned, became a Baha'i in 1889, three years before the passing of the Blessed Beauty. Before embracing the faith, he had ranked as a scholar and made important literary contributions. He was to write a number of books on the proofs of the faith, and during the ministry of Abdul Baha, he played a major role in the teaching work, including the education of Baha'i youth. The founding of the Tadbiyat School, the most prestigious educational institution in the country, was in part due to his dedicated efforts. Eight hours after sunset, on the 29th of May, 1892, the Blessed Beauty took his flight from this mortal plane to the Abha Kingdom. The sun of Baha has set, were the words communicated immediately to the Turkish Sultan, Abdul Hamid. Suddenly, the Baha'i world found itself cut off from that divine source of revelation Grief and sorrow overwhelmed all believers and the many others represented at his funeral. In his will and testament, the Kyatab e Acht, here shown in a transcribed copy, Baha'u'llah appointed his son Abdul Baha as the center of the covenant. Under the direct supervision of the master, Abdul Baha, one of the great services of the four hands of the cause after the ascension of Baha'u'llah was the stewardship of the Baha'i community. Here, the hands are seen seated amongst the friends. During his lifetime, Baha'u'llah had directed the hands to consult among themselves and with other believers on issues concerning the growth and development of the Baha'i community. He emphasized in his writings the importance of consultation. To this end, Abdul Baha instructed the hands of the cause to elect the first spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Tehran, the first such assembly in the Baha'i world. This historic picture shows the result of the election with three of the four hands sitting in the middle. An important feature was that the first assembly had members from Zoroastrian and Jewish backgrounds, an unprecedented event in a society dominated by religious prejudice.
Ibn Abhar was a driving force in the promotion of the education of women. He and his wife played important roles on a special committee formed in 1909 for the liberation of women in Persian society and were instrumental in the formation of the Spiritual Assembly of Baha'i Women in 1910. This picture, taken in 1916, is of the Ladies' Committee of Tehran. As a result of the diligent efforts of Ibn Abhar and his wife, the first Baha'i school for girls was founded in Tehran. It grew and became known as the Tarbiyat School for Girls, seen here in later years. It was these important initiatives which led to the elevation of the role of women in Persian society and to the creation of various committees such as this, called the Taragiyya Nesvan, or Progress of Women, and the first National Women's Convention in 1945. Janabe Ibn Asdaq lived the longest of the four hands and was the only one to witness the ministry of Shoghi Effendi. At the bidding of Abdul Baha, Ibn Asdaq traveled extensively, visiting India and Burma. In the aftermath of the First World War, he presented a tablet addressed by Abdul Baha to the Central Organization for a Durable Peace at The Hague. During his lifetime, the master did not appoint any living hands of the cause, only conferring this rank on a few posthumously. He authorized Shoghi Effendi, however, to appoint hands during his ministry, and in his will and testament describes the duty of the hands. The obligations of the hands of the cause of God are to diffuse the divine fragrances, to edify the souls of men, to promote learning, to improve the character of all men, and to be at all times and under all conditions sanctified and detached from earthly things. They must manifest the fear of God by their conduct, their manner, their deeds and their words. During the ministry of Abdul Baha, four individuals received posthumously the distinction of the title Hand of the Cause of God. Mullah Sadaq Khurasani, known as Esmullah al Astaq, Agha Muhammad Qa'ini, known as Nabil Akbar, Sheikh Muhammad Reza Yazdi, and Mirza Ali Muhammad Varqa, the martyr. Hand of the Cause is Mullah al Asdaq, here portrayed in an artist's rendition, was the father of Janab Ibn Asdaq, Hand of the Cause appointed by Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha provides an account of the senior Asdaq in Memorials of the Faithful. When young, Ismullah al Asdaq joined the circle of Sayyid Qazim in search of the Promised One and became one of his disciples. In Shiraz, he became a believer in the Bab and accompanied Mullah Hussein to Fort Tabarsi. The shrine of Sheikh Tabarsi, seen here as it stood then, was a holy spot of worship for Muslims. A fort then was built around this shrine as a sanctuary from the onslaught of enemy forces. The story of the gallantry of 313 men against thousands of government forces over a period of several months is legendary. The end came when the government forces took a solemn oath on the Holy Quran to allow the Babis to leave in peace. Such was not to be. The Babis were slaughtered after leaving the fort. Janab Ismullah al Asdaq, unlike many of his companions, miraculously survived the massacre, and his zeal to teach became greater than ever. He attained the presence of Baha'u'llah in Iraq, and then again in the most great prison in Akko. Hand of the cause Nabila Akbar, another to be honored by Abdul Baha, was given the title of Mujtahed by a leading theologian in the holy city of Najaf. He excelled not only in theology, but also in humanities and the medical field. He was also greatly revered in religious circles. This 
great poet's love for Baha'u'llah is described in this verse. A thousand ways I tried my love to hide, but how could I, upon that blazing pyre, not catch fire? In time, the clergy became so envious of Nabil's fame and influence that they informed Nasr din Shah, who arose against him with all his might. Nabil had to seek anonymity, removing the turban which noted his rank. He continued his travel teaching and administered his healing skills as a physician until he died penniless in the far-off city of Bukhara. He left a rich legacy of his masterly works and deeds. Sheikh Muhammad Reza Yazdi was a staunch defender of the faith and had a great depth of understanding of the station of Baha'u'llah. He suffered greatly during the time of Baha'u'llah and was imprisoned along with others after the attempt on the life of Nasreddin Shah. The precise circumstances of his passing are not known, except that he died while in prison. After his death, Abdul Baha conferred on him the title of Hand of the Cause of God. Mirza Ali Muhammad, a native of Yazd, was a poet of outstanding caliber. While on pilgrimage, he was given the title of Varga, or Dove, by Baha'u'llah. So transfixed was he by Baha'u'llah's personage and utterances, and so moved by the example of the master, Abdul Baha, that he sought martyrdom in his path. When he returned to Persia, Varga renewed his plea for martyrdom for himself and on behalf of one of his sons. Baha'u'llah acquiesced. They were martyred during the ministry of Abdul Baha in 1896. Varga and his son Ruhullah were first imprisoned. Shortly afterwards, Ruhullah saw his father's stomach pierced and cut up before his very eyes. Ruhullah was offered his life if he recanted his faith, but he refused, crying that he wanted to join his father, whereupon the young boy of 12 was strangled to death. Thus ended the life of two immortal heroes of the Baha'i dispensation. Abdul Baha was so moved by their examples that in his eulogy he bestowed unparalleled praise in honor of these unique martyrs of the Baha'i faith. The year 1921 signifies an important transition in the evolution of the Baha'i faith. This was the year that Abdul Baha left this earthly plane. Friends, the time is coming when I shall no longer be with you. I have done all that could be done. I have served the cause of Baha'u'llah to the utmost of my ability. I have labored night and day all the years of my life. Oh, how I long to see the friends shouldering the responsibilities of the cause. Remember, whether or not I be on earth, my presence will be with you always. The news spread like wildfire. It was flashed over the wires to all parts of the globe and was reported by major papers, including the New York World and the Times of London. The British Secretary of State for the Colonies, Winston Churchill, immediately telegraphed the High Commissioner for Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel, instructing him to convey to the Baha'i community on behalf of His Majesty's government their sympathy and condolence. Similar messages poured in from far and wide, showing the esteem that dignitaries and common folk alike held for Abdu'l-Bahá. This was again demonstrated 
by the thousands who attended his funeral. With the passing of Abdul Baha in 1921, the heroic age of the Baha'i faith drew to a symbolic close, a period characterized by valiant martyrs and teachers of the cause. Thus began the formative years, when sacrifices of a different nature would be called for in the development and expansion of the administrative institutions of the faith. Shoghi Effendi, Abdul Baha's grandson, was a student at Oxford at that time, studying at Balliol College. It was a terrible shock to a young man of 24 who had happily come to Oxford only a year earlier to complete his studies, as he explained in a letter to a friend, to equip myself for those things I shall require in my future service to the cause. While in Haifa, before coming to Oxford, he had acted as the master's secretary and translator of his tablets. It was the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdu'l-Bahá, who was his solace and help during the difficult days of his return to the Holy Land, a place he had left with the assurances of the master's presence and guiding hand. Now, the full responsibility was to be carried by him as the new center of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Here in the master's home, he took up residence and spent a considerable time meeting the many obligations thrust upon his shoulders. During these difficult years, in addition to his beloved great aunt, the greatest holy leaf, he relied on the support of the Baha'i world, which without hesitation arose to heed every command of their beloved new leader. One who was particularly close to Shoghi Effendi was John Esselmont, shown here during happier times with the beloved guardian. A physician, John Esselmont learned Persian well and on the guardian's invitation left his native Scotland for Haifa in 1924. He was the author of the most widely read book on the faith, Baha'u'llah and the New Era. The Guardian sought Dr. Esselmont's advice on a range of matters, including the translation of extracts from Baha'i writings, and was grief-stricken of the passing of this trusted friend in 1925, after a period of illness. Dr. Esselmont was the first to be given the title of Hand of the Cause of God by the beloved Guardian, the highest honor that could be bestowed on an individual. He was laid to rest in the Baha'i Cemetery in Haifa. Others who were referred to as Hands of the Cause posthumously in order were Haji Abul Hassan, known as Haji Amin. Haji Amin had served as trustee of Hurrullah, the right of God, from the time of Baha'u'llah and enjoyed a very eventful life. His heroic deeds and imprisonment in Qazvin have already been noted. He had the honor to serve as trustee under all central figures of the Baha'i faith for a total period of 43 years, dedicating all his energies in the path of service. He was lauded by Shoghi Effendi, who on his passing said that his exemplary services will eternally illuminate annals of cause. A graduate of Vassar with a master's in English literature Keith Ransom Kaler was a distinguished Baha'i who set out on a world tour to promote the Baha'i faith in 1929. At the bidding of the Guardian, she came to Iran in 1932 to assist with the work of that community. Specifically, as an ambassador representing the North American Baha'i community, she was to appeal to the Iranian government to lift the ban on the entry of Baha'i literature into Iran. Despite her eloquence and presence in important circles and amongst the friends, she is seen here with a group of Baha'i women, she had commented to Mr. Zikrullah Khadem, when one looks back at these times, one will be astonished at how Baha'u'llah chose an old, weak, and ordinary woman like me to come to Persia and serve him in this manner. Who am I? 
Yet in the words of Shoghi Effendi himself, it was the tenacity and self-sacrifice of the fearless and brilliant Keith Ransom Kaler, the first American martyr, who, heedless of warnings of age and ill health, had journeyed to Persia pleading the cause of her downtrodden brethren through several petitions to the Shah, and had finally succumbed in Esfahan. The immortal Martha Root first heard of the faith in 1908 from Roy Wilhelm, another illustrious Baha'i who was to be declared a hand of the cause of God on his passing. Martha Root met Abdu'l Baha on his trip to America and was the first to respond to his Tablets of the Divine Plan in 1919. She was to spend the rest of her life circling the globe more than four times meeting with and proclaiming the faith fearlessly to kings, queens, presidents, clergy, professors and common folk alike. Beginning in 1926, Martha Root had a succession of eight audiences with Queen Marie of Romania. Queen Marie was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria of Great Britain, who was one of the sovereigns addressed by Baha'u'llah. Through Martha Root, Queen Marie became the first monarch to embrace the faith of Baha'u'llah and to fearlessly champion his cause. This testimonial in Queen Marie's own handwriting was considered by Shoghi Effendi to be significant evidence of the progress of the cause. A professional journalist, prolific writer and accomplished lecturer Martha Root gave addresses at no less than 400 universities and colleges around the world. But the images most recorded are of her visiting the diverse Baha'i communities. She never enjoyed particular good health and passed away in 1939 in Honolulu after a severe illness. The beloved guardian's grief-stricken message to the Baha'i world in her honor indicates, Concourse on high, acclaim her elevation, rightful position, galaxy, Baha'i immortals. And as the foremost hand which Abdul Baha's will has raised up in first Baha'i century, bringing unperishable luster to the American Baha'i community. Abdul Jalil Bey Sa'ad was taught the faith by the great Baha'i scholar Mirza Abdul Fazl, who was sent to Egypt by Abdul Baha in 1895. A judge in the civil courts of Egypt and a libertarian, in the late 1920s and 1930s, he was to directly defend the faith from the onslaught of opposition. He supported the claims of the Baha'is to the prosecutor general and gained recognition for the faith. Here he is seen with fellow hands Keith Ransom Kaler and Hojitari Esfani, another to be named posthumously a hand during this period. To silence him, the authorities banished Abdul Jalil to a remote part of Upper Egypt, where he used the time at his disposal to translate the Dawnbreakers into Arabic. Later, he secured permission to build the Hazirat al Quds in Cairo. On his passing in 1941, the Guardian eulogized him as the foremost champion of faith in Egypt, an outstanding Baha'i administrator, a brilliant and indefatigable teacher, and bestowed upon him the rank of Hand of the Cause. Another valiant Baha'i was Mustafa Rumi, a scholar well-versed in the writings of other great religions. He served Abdul Baha in Burma and traveled extensively, meeting Baha'i friends throughout India and Southeast Asia. In 1899, he and some other believers carried the marble sarcophagus designed to contain the remains of the Bab to the Holy Land. Some 10 years later, on March the 21st, 1909, 
the master was at last able to transfer the sarcophagus to the mausoleum on Mount Carmel and there inter the wooden casket containing the holy remains of the Bab. Near the end of the Second World War, Sayyid Mustafa was killed at the age of 99, together with some other believers in Burma. In a tribute, the beloved guardian eulogized him as distinguished pioneer and the staunch, high-minded, noble soul whose magnificent achievements fully entitle him to join ranks of hands of the cause of Baha'u'llah. Muhammad Taqiyya Isfahani, while in the presence of Baha'u'llah in 1878, heard chanted the tablets revealed for the two heroic martyrs known as the King and the Beloved of Martyrs. His soul became enraptured by these illustrious examples of servitude, and he dedicated himself to the service of Baha'u'llah, and later to the master, Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha visited Muhammad Taqiyya in Egypt en route to his historic Western tour of Europe and North America, as did the learned Abul Fazl and the devoted Lua Getzinger during the last days of their life. Lewis Gregory was born in 1874 in Charleston, South Carolina. The son of a slave, he graduated from college and earned a degree of law from Howard University. He was the first of his race to achieve the station of Hand of the Cause of God. Dearly beloved, noble-minded, golden-hearted Lewis Gregory were the beloved guardian's words on his passing. While Lewis Gregory suffered more than his share of racial humiliation and abuse, he never developed a grudge or hatred for the oppressors of his race. On his first pilgrimage in the presence of Abdul Baha, Lewis Gregory met Louisa Matthews, an English Baha'i, and later through the encouragement of Abdul Baha, married her. Returning from his pilgrimage a transformed man, Lewis Gregory championed the cause of racial unity and promoted harmony wherever he traveled. He addressed many audiences, such as this Baha'i Race Amity Convention in 1921. He was elected to the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and Canada, which he served for 14 years. An incident which exemplified Abdul Baha's commitment to racial equality occurred while he was in Washington during his tour of America in 1912. He had been invited by Ali Kuli Khan, the chargé d'affaires of the Persian legation, to attend a luncheon in his honor. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, and Admiral Peary, fresh from his conquest of the North Pole, were among the dignitaries invited to the reception. Among the Baha'is were the artist Juliet Thompson and Louis Gregory, who'd been invited at the last minute on the personal request of Abdul Baha. When the luncheon was announced and Abdul Baha was leading the invited guests to the dining room to be seated, the master suddenly noticed that Mr. Gregory was not there. Bring Mr. Gregory, he said. And while awaiting his arrival, he rearranged the place settings so that Louis Gregory had the seat of honor at his right. When Louis Gregory joined them, Abdul Baha announced how pleased he was to have Mr. Gregory there. And in the most natural way, he proceeded to give a talk on the oneness of mankind. Roy Wilhelm, a successful businessman and entrepreneur, on pilgrimage with his mother, went to visit Abdul Baha and was truly transformed as a Baha'i. He was very dear to Abdul Baha, who told him, I am pleased with you to the utmost. During Abdul Baha's tour of America, Roy was always at his call. 
It was at his property in West Englewood, New Jersey, that Abdul Baha held the unity feast for the Baha'is of the New York metropolitan area. Abdul Baha predicted that the site of that gathering would become a public memorial in observance of his visit, and indeed, this event has been celebrated annually ever since. Roy Wilhelm, who financed Martha Root's journeys, remarked in later years that his chief purpose in being born was to get Martha Root started on her journeys. A man of great integrity and honesty, Roy Wilhelm was for many years the treasurer of the Baha'i Temple Unity and later a member of the National Spiritual Assembly. Upon his passing, the beloved guardian praised his sterling qualities and elevated him to join the ranks of Hands of the Cause on the 21st of December, 1951. He was the last hand to be appointed posthumously prior to the appointment of Living Hands of the Cause. 